Welcome. Today I would like to give you a short introduction to route planning algorithms. Dijkstra's algorithm is typically motivated by the application of route planning and we're going to see today to what extent Dijkstra's algorithm is useful in route planning. Concepts that I'm going to show you today are bidirectional search, transit node routing, and I'll also talk a little bit about algorithm engineering. The starting point will be Dijkstra's algorithm, so if you don't know Dijkstra's algorithm yet, I suggest that you watch the video that I made about it. I will also now have a very quick reminder of what Dijkstra's algorithm is. Here we have a directed graph with non-negative edge weights and we want to compute the distance from S to all other nodes. And we do so by first setting all of the distances to infinity except for S because we can reach S from itself with a distance of zero. And then we process the nodes one by one, always starting with the so far unprocessed nodes with the smallest distance, so that is currently S, and we look at whether we can reach the adjacent nodes via S with a smaller distance than the distance that we already know. And because we have, don't know any distances yet, this is indeed the case. So we now can reach the one node with a distance of 10, the other one with a distance of five. And we continue again with the one that currently has the smallest distance, so that's a five, and we look at its adjacent nodes and so on. Eventually, this will compute the shortest path from S to all other nodes. And that was Dijkstra's algorithm in very, very short. Now back to route planning. In route planning, we want to find the fastest route from a starting location S to a target location T. And we can model that using graphs. So we take the street network, we model it as a graph, and as edge weights, we take the travel times. And then the shortest path in that graph, so shortest path, meaning the one with the smallest sum of edge weights, so the smallest sum of travel times, that is then our fastest route. This very much looks like what we've seen when we were talking about Dijkstra's algorithm. So the natural question is, does Dijkstra's algorithm solve the route planning problem? Let's first take what I here will call the classic algorithm design perspective and we start with modeling the problem. So we've modeled the problem as a graph problem, namely as finding the shortest path in a graph. Then we need to design an algorithm, or here we don't need to design an algorithm. We can take an existing algorithm, namely the one designed by Dijkstra. And we also want to make sure that it is efficient. So for that, we look at the theoretical analysis. And indeed, the running time is O of V log V plus E where V is a number of vertices, E is a number of edges, so that's efficient. Now, once again, does this solve the route planning problem? Yes, but let's look at some actual data. So, for instance, here we have a road network of Europe, and it's simply huge. So, yes, we can run Dijkstra's algorithm on this road network, but it will not be quite fast enough for the query time that we would like to have. So we have an efficient shortest path algorithm, but it's not fast enough for the application that we have in mind. What can we do? So if we want to have a practical algorithm, it makes perfect sense that we also integrate implementation and experimentation in our design process. And that's exactly what this cycle here shows. So we still have the modeling, we still have the design and the theoretical analysis, but we combine it with implementation and experimentation, and then also let the experimentation inform again the modeling and so on. And this is what we call algorithm engineering. So here we started with the shortest path problem. We saw Dijkstra's algorithm, we analyzed it, and now we come to the implementation. And already for Dijkstra's algorithm, there are very interesting questions to answer here. For instance, which data structure do we want to use for our priority queue? So we've seen min heaps, we talked about Fibonacci heaps, but if you want to have a practical implementation, you probably don't want to use Fibonacci heaps. You could use min heaps, but there are also alternatives that might be faster. But let's continue with the questions of experimentation. And there we want to look at where do we lose time or where do we do computations that are unnecessary. Now let's have a look at an example. And as an example, I want to find a route in my hometown. So this is Bochum. So let's assume I just did a nice walk in the botanical garden. I'm now going back to my car 
that I want to go to the most famous museum, that is the mining museum. So the botanical garden is here, my car is standing up there, and now I'm going to route to the mining museum. So this is not yet Dijkstra's algorithm, this is simply what Google Maps gives me. So let's see what I would do if I would be using Dijkstra's algorithm. So here I'm back at my starting location, I would set its distance to zero, all other distances to infinity, I would then relax the edges to the adjacent vertices or nodes and continue from there. At some point I would have explored or I would have found all of the nodes that I can reach within one minute, so that would be everything in this region, then this would be everything that I can reach within two minutes, three minutes, at this point I will need to zoom out, but now I also already have reached the freeway. So let me zoom out. Here you again then see what I can reach in three minutes. This is now what I can reach in four minutes. Eight minutes. Now I have to zoom out again. So in ten minutes I can already get quite far. And then finally in fourteen minutes I've reached the museum. Now, of course, Dijkstra's algorithm computes the shortest distance from S to all other nodes. So, in principle, it would continue here, but that's our first time saver. Let's stop as soon as we've found what we have been looking for. But even if we stop Dijkstra's algorithm at this point, we've definitely have explored nodes which aren't on the way to the mining museum. So, here we have nodes in Dortmund or down here or halfway to Essen, which definitely would not be on our way to the mining museum. So let's see how we can avoid visiting those nodes. And for that, let's make some observations about Dijkstra's algorithm. And the first one is that Dijkstra finds the shortest path by a forward search from S to T. So you can imagine this growing as growing a ball around S until it hits T. So we could have used Dijkstra's algorithm just as well as doing the same from T so growing this ball around T and finding all of the places that can reach T quicker than where I'm starting until I hit my starting location also and then I stop. So that's the black shape that I do here on the right also. And again, it's a different shape, but it also has places where we definitely would have never had to go to to get to the mining museum. But the idea now is that, and that's why this also says bidirectional search, we can combine those two ideas. So if we combine both, what that means is that we, at the same time we do a forward search from where we're starting and we're doing a backward search from where we want to go to. And as soon as those two meet, we can stop. And in this way we overall explore fewer nodes, at least that is the hope. So there are some things here where we have to be careful about. So for instance, what does it mean that we run the algorithm simultaneously? Are we indeed running them in parallel or are we alternatingly running one and the other for a step? Then also, what does it mean when they meet? So when two regions here meet, or if they find the same node, then we still need to be careful that we compute the shortest path correctly, but that can be done. So let's assume we do this. Here's our first quiz. How much faster do we expect bidirectional search to be compared to the simple forward search? Do we expect them to be just as fast, two to four times faster, ten times faster? We're expecting the bidirectional search to be two to four times faster. Why is that the case? So we can look at this from the geometric perspective. So if I do the forward search, then I'm essentially exploring this blue circle here and in the bidirectional search, those two circles. So let's compare the areas of those two. So if the distance here, if that's R, then the area of this one is pi R squared. And here the radii I are, are half, so there I get uh, 2 times pi r half squared, and that's pi r squared divided by 2. So that would be twice as fast 
and then we could also use parallelization. So roughly two to four times faster. Now let's see how far we are in terms of our algorithm design. So we started with Dijkstra's algorithm. We did an analysis. Let's assume we did an implementation and experimentation. Instead, we looked at an example. From that, we concluded that a bidirectional search would be a good idea. In terms of theoretical analysis, bidirectional search is actually difficult to handle. So an average case analysis is possible. Implementation, there are again interesting questions. So for instance, if you want to use parallelization. And then we could be doing experiments again, and then we would see that yes, it's faster, but not fast enough. So a query on the network of Europe would now take around a second, which doesn't sound too bad. But if you think of an online setting with many users, and each of those takes a second of computation time, then that would be too much for the system. So that is too slow. So we have to bring in additional ideas, and those will now come from the modeling because we so far didn't really use that we have a street network. Are there properties of the street network that we could use to make our algorithms faster? Let's have a look at some road network data. And this is again the data of Europe. So it's a large data set, 18 million nodes. The graph is sparse in the sense that the number of edges is linear in terms of the number of nodes, 42 million to be precise. And the graph is nearly planar in the sense that if to edges cross, there's actually a crossing. So there's actually a node there, except if we have bridges. Now, when is the computation of the shortest path expensive? It's expensive if we have to look at many nodes. But that also means that we're traveling very far. If we travel very far, we actually use important roads, motorways, and we go to those motorways using certain access points. So our route is actually very restricted, and that's something we're going to make use of. Let's again look at this by example. So here I'm again starting at my parking lot, but now I'm going far. I'm going far north. And let me mark an important node here. And now let me start dragging this point around and see how often the node that I use as an access point changes. Okay, so once I can use this access point all the time, all the time, all the time. Let's see. Oh, one more time. So I needed three access points here. And now let me also try the following. Let me start somewhere else. So let me now start at the mining museum, more or less. I'm still, I'm using one of the access points that I already had. Now it's second one. Third one. And that's actually all. So here, for both locations that I was looking at, I had three access points so that any shortest path that goes far enough away uses one of those three access points. So for every start location, if I'm doing a long distance route, then it goes through a small number of access points. And in Europe, that's typically 10 access points per starting location. Also, an access location is relevant for not just for that starting location, but for many starting locations. And therefore I can look at a total at a set of access points, which is relatively small overall. This is called the transit nodes. And for Europe, 10,000 transit nodes are enough to have access points for all possible starting locations. But how can we now use the transit nodes for fast route queries? The answer is pre-processing, in particular pre-computing distances. For instance, if I have 10,000 transit nodes, then between any pair of transit nodes, I can pre-compute the distance and store that. And that's also the first thing that we're going to do. We first need to determine the set of transit nodes, and then we pre-compute the distances between transit nodes. But now we also have to get to those transit nodes. So for any starting location, I compute its access nodes which are transit nodes, but the ones that that starting location uses. Same for target locations. So I have access nodes that then reach that target. And I pre-compute also all of those distances. And now a query is very simple. So again, I'm starting at my parking lot. I have my three access nodes. 
let's say I want to go to T. T also has access nodes, let's say it also has three. Now, between any pair here, and I only have three times three, so nine pairs, I have pre-computed the distance. So out of now the nine distances that I get, and that is distance from S to its access node, access node to access node of T, then from the access node of T to T. If I take all of those distances, I take the smallest one, I found my shortest path. And that's very fast. Now this only works if S and T are far enough apart. So if S and T are close by, then I can use a different algorithm. For instance, I can simply then use bidirectional Dijkstra. And because they are very close, it will also be very fast. Now is this feasible? Let's think about it in a quiz. So how much storage do I need to do this? So I have Europe, 18 million nodes, 42 million edges, let's say 10,000 transit nodes, on average 10 access nodes. And let's say for distances, to store distances, I use 16 bytes. How much storage do I need for this approach? Is it in the range of megabytes, gigabytes, or terabytes? It's in the range of gigabytes. So let's do the calculation. So the distances that I'm storing is 10 for each node and then between any pair of transit nodes. So I have 10 to the four transit nodes, so 10 to the eight distances there. Then 18 million nodes, that times 10 is 1.8 times 10 to the eight. Let's add that up. That's something in the range of 10 to the eight, 2.8 times 10 to the eight. Now I'm using 16 byte for each of these. So let's multiply this with 16. This gives me something in the range of four and a half gigabytes. There are many design and implementation questions that I left open so far, which I also will simply leave open in this video. So for instance, the question of how do I compute the transit nodes? So that is a very interesting algorithmic question by itself, but also the question of how do I detect that two nodes are too close to use transit node routing and which algorithm do I then use instead? Do I indeed use bidirectional text? In terms of the analysis, transit node routing performs very well. So in particular, if I assume that the number of transit nodes is small and here order of square root of the vertices. And if I have a constant number of access nodes per starting location and target location, then I actually only need linear storage and get constant query time. So that's very fast. In terms of experiments or its practical performance, Transit node routing is very fast. So we need 1.25 microseconds per query. And that is 2 million times faster than Dijkstra's algorithm. In terms of pre-computation, it only takes 20 minutes. Storage, I actually in my quiz overestimated, we can do it with around two gigabytes. So that is a very impressive performance. There is much more to the world of route planning algorithms. So I really just scratched the surface. Here are some of the most important route planning algorithms with query time plotted against storage. And both axes use logarithmic scaling. And you see right up here Dijkstra's algorithm. So Dijkstra's algorithm is very slow compared to other algorithms. Transit node routing sits down here. So that's one of the very fast algorithms. Also in terms of storage doesn't do that badly. So that's a really nice algorithm. But as you see, there's much more to the world of route planning algorithms and also still many interesting questions to solve. Back to our algorithm design cycle. So we used important roads, we used important nodes that led us to transit node routing. In terms of the theoretical analysis, it performs well. I didn't talk that much about implementation, but in terms of experiments or the practical performance, this is now a very fast algorithm. What have we seen? Coming back to the question whether Dijkstra's algorithm is used for route planning. Yes, but there's much more to the story and we've seen a little bit of this. We've seen bidirectional Dijkstra. We've seen transit node routing. As a way of designing practical algorithms, we've seen algorithm engineering where we do modeling, design, analysis, implementation, and experimentation in a cycle and that way design algorithms with good theoretical guarantees, practical performance, which are also relevant in applications. And that's all for today. See you next time.